Haunted Glass. Woo! Welcome to another edition of Death Curse Society, gang. It is time to get all up into it right here on the show. I'm your host, Red Crank. I got the Colonel, and I got Zigzag. Woo! Happy Halloween. What, what the fuck, man? You gonna say nothing here? What the hell? This isn't our Halloween episode. What the hell it ain't? <laughs> what, what the fuck, man? No one even dressed up. I look like a fucking asshole over here. Now we'll have a little something special for Halloween next week. Cool mask, Colonel. Hell yeah. Thanks Hot for, as fuck. Thanks for dressing up. Don't, don't, uh, yeah, don't suffocate in there. Before we get started, guys, don't forget to subscribe and make sure to hit that notification bell so you don't miss an episode or any update from us. We do not have a sponsor for this particular episode, so if you are interested in being part of the Death Curse Society show, let us know. Reach out to us at deathcursesociety at gmail.com, and we'll let you know how you can be a sponsor for each individual show. we got a lot to cover in this episode, including The Walking Dead, Satanic Panic on DVD and Video on Demand, Maniac Cop possibly coming to HBO, Are You Afraid of the Dark's debut on Nickelodeon, Friday the 13th, Game Over, a new fan film coming out soon that's raising money. Also, another fan film raising money right now on Indiegogo, Dylan's New Nightmare. We got a lot to talk about with that one. And then, of course, a little bit more stuff on top of that. But before we get to all of that goodness, let's go camping. You're going to camp blood, ain't you? You'll never come back again. It's got a death curse. For Let's Go Camping this time around, we're going to be talking about the new film that's in theaters right now, Zombieland Double Tap. It brings a whole gang back together, and it's a lot of fun. Colonel, let's talk to you and start with you on this. I'm not going to give the whole synopsis, because you pretty much get that from the trailers. Uh, Little Rock runs off with some fucking hippie. <laughs> they go to find her make sure she's safe. That, that's the fucking story. It's the adventure from the time they leave there. I mean, that's literally it. Great humor. The whole scenes in the White House is fucking hilarious to me, especially Lincoln's blindfold. I don't know how you want to classify these. I classify these as cameos. I wasn't a big fan of. I really didn't think introducing these people for such short amounts of time really added to the story. Man, it worked for a gag, but to as far as the story went, it was unnecessary. Except for our new character, Madison, I thought she was fucking hilarious. Oh my God, she was the perfect person to join that group. Because she's the complete opposite of fucking everybody. I really don't know what else to say without giving too much away. Like, there's more shit I want to say, but I got to save some for these guys. I thought this was a lot of fun for a sequel. I wasn't sure what to expect. I was hoping they weren't going to try to stray too far away from the original formula that made the film work, which primarily was just a simple storyline and emphasizing the interaction between these four characters. And that's what they did. Like Colonel just said, the story is simple. Little Rock runs off with some guy and the rest of her family wants to go and save her or, or find her again and make sure she's safe at least. Maybe not take her away from this hipster douchebag, but at least help. So the story was really simple, and that really helped propel the comedy and even the action in this. So I thought it was good. Ziggy, what do you got? Yeah, I also enjoyed it very much. You know, a lot of it's the same thing as what we had before. Not as original the second time around. I mean, that's obvious, you know. But that, having said all that, it's still what you would expect from the same four core characters coming back for a sequel. Now 10 years in this post-apocalyptic world. I will give one spoiler. No Twinkies in the whole movie. No mentions of Twinkies. And that was kind of a big threat in the first one. That was kind of like, man, his whole motivation was finding Twinkies and shit. And, uh, you know, well, that's kind of a, it was an overlook, I think, on their part, you know, for an, a, a quick gag joke. I mean, that's we, we had a lot of rehashing on different things in the movie this time around. They do reference kills of the week, kills of the year, and stuff like that again. So you do get a little bit of that. Maybe not as much as I'd hoped. Obviously, you had to run into some new humans. Yeah. Along the way, other survivors, and they did that. You know, Colonel brushed on that. I, I won't call them cameos because they're a little bit more than that. You know, they or you know they they set them up to be anyway. The zombies have evolved too this time around. They're a little tougher and a little smarter, and they, you know you get caught up in what they have nicknames and everything. So it is there is new stuff there for you know the casual fan that wanted to come in and not see the same movie again. You're covered. Zombie Land Two Double Tap. It's going to give you all you want. There's a whole lot of Columbus's rules in there that pop up like they did in the first one all over the place. And there's a gag that they do kind of hint to in the trailer. 
where Tallahassee's talking to a guy that's almost exactly like him. We'll leave it at that. Take it as it were from there, you know, and it's, uh, it, it is good though. Kind of wraps up the same way the first one did. They're like, till next time, we'll see you. You know what I mean? So, but uh, it, it is very good. I mean, for a zombie movie, a zomcom is a reference that we've kind of embraced around here. It's it's top notch. It's better than uh, The Dead Don't Die, you know, if you're wondering. But yeah, I, it, I don't know if they really had to make this movie, but they didn't totally fuck it up. It was nice catching up with these guys again. Yeah, that that's kind of where I'm at. Did they need to make this movie? No. But did they screw it up when they made a second one? No, I don't think they did. Like I said, they kept the same spirit of the characters, and that was the main attraction to me, at least, of the original one. And I'll tell you what, the opening scene, when they're, stor- they're storming the White House, that's kind of where they're going to go and set up their camp. When the Master of Puppets starts playing, bro, whoa. Now, I'm a metalhead. Colonel's a metalhead. You might not be a metalhead, but this doesn't get any more appropriate for setting the soundtrack for what we're watching, and it's fucking glorious. Yeah, I almost broke out. I wish I had a sock with me when they started doing it, to be honest <laughs> with you. But I'm not I'm no Paul Rubens. So I had to settle down a little bit. As far as the introduction of the new people, I thought the new people were there just long enough. Maybe a little too long, but the new couple of guys that mirrored, you know, Woody Harrelson and Jesse Eisenberg especially, when they were introduced, I was worried they were going to be with them for a while, but they weren't, and the gag played out the way it should have, and then it was over, and we moved on with the rest of the story, and I thought, okay, good. That was the one thing I was kind of worried about with watching the trailer and going into this movie. I thought that was going to be a running theme through the entire second act of the movie, the fact that it's less than, what, 10 minutes? But like Colonel said, Madison is definitely a refreshing burst of energy into this group. Because the group has kind of stagnated, it seems like, over the 10 years that they've been together. Which is one of the reasons why Little Rock wants to escape in the first place. She's kind of bored. She wants to get out and escape and enjoy life. Yeah, Madison, just the stereotypical dumb blonde. Tallahassee actually drops a line when they're saying, look, the only reason she's still alive is because zombies eat brains and she don't fucking have any. She plays it perfect, too. And I'm usually annoyed by those kind of characters, but uh, somehow in this one, she is absolutely perfect. She was just charming. Yes. In a dumb way. It worked with a kind of a juxtaposition to the other characters. Of course, Tallahassee is always over the top, and it's good to see Woody Harrelson have another moment to to portray a comedic character again. He doesn't he doesn't do it as often as he used to. The only kind of back with Madison and her with the dynamic of the group. It, it was, she was just so innocent compared to them. Like the scene where uh, the RV zombies are on the way, she's like, "They're more scared of you than you are of them." Like, and they're like, "Shut up!" <laughs> She works. She's so fucking dumb it works. We do also have a a true, once again, outstanding cameo that is totally steals the entire movie, in my opinion. Mm -hmm. It was great. We'll leave leave that to you, though, to see and guess who it might be. It's fucking great, though. You're, You're talking about the end credit one, right? The end credits, yes. Yeah, definitely stay. Well, I mean, you don't even get a chance really to stand up. They they took no chances that you would miss this. The credits rolled for what ten seconds before they stop it and go. Oh, by the way, yeah. Bing! Columbus jumps back in and goes, "Hey, by the way, you know there was a reference to something made. You really wanted to know. Here is like it goes to day zero. We'll just leave it at that. Day one of the infection yeah. leaves you smiling." It was definitely a nice little cherry on top of the milkshake. Absolutely. All right, let's rank it. Ziggy, give us a ranking, 1 to 10. Wow, Zombieland 2 double tap. I was uh, pretty much entertained. The dumb jokes were great. The headier jokes were funny, too, that you had to get. You know what I mean? They're just kind of there. But it's, man, well worth it and uh, a worthy sequel. I'm going to go ahead and give this a solid 7.5. Very entertaining, worth the price of a mission. It will be added to my collection on Blu ray. The Leaning Tower of Pisa is enough for me to even give us a seven. That being said, I'm gonna give a little bit of a notch for my favorite orange cat and give a 7.25. Well, we're all right in the same ballpark, it looks like, because I'm giving it a seven and a half. It wasn't more than I expected, and it wasn't less than I expected. It was right in the ballpark of what I wanted from a sequel to Zombie Land. That, that means a lot anymore, because most of the time when people do sequels, they either fuck up the something in the original, or they're just doing it for a money grab. And granted, this may have been a money grab, but they did it the right way, and I, I enjoyed it. So I'm, I'm going with a 7.5. One, uh, you, you mentioned something about 
you know, the jokes that are there that you might miss. And Colonel already mentioned the blindfold on Abraham Lincoln in the Lincoln bedroom, which I like. The other <laughs> one is, I don't know if you guys noticed this, but the fact that Tallahassee uses Taft's presidential photo as wrapping paper. I like that because 20 minutes later in a scene where I think Columbus <laughs> and uh, Columbus and Wichita are arguing, there's the picture of Taft with a big fucking hole cut out of it just in the background. Just the, even the little line he gives, you know, like, yeah, I used Taft because, you know, he was a larger president. And there's more. If you need more wrapping paper, there's plenty left. I was telling Zach last night, like the whole uh, Fellowship of the Ring gift. Oh, <laughs> like there's like original print of Lord of the Rings, Fellowship of the Ring. Oh, look at that. It's got your name on it. Mine too. It's a perfectly preserved piece of paper. Thank you so much. <laughs> Oh, and you wrote all over it. Oh, great. <laughs> his, his delivery of that was uh, stupendous. All of those cats have good comedy chops. Like we talked about in a previous rendition of this show, this would not work if there was only one of them or two of them that came back. The only way a sequel to Zombieland would work is if all four of the main core cast came back. If it ever comes a point that a zombie three is even thought about and one of them says no, cancel that shit right now. Don't even think about it. Well, that's going to wrap it up for Let's Go Camping. We're going to take a quick break, and we'll be back right after this. Stick around. Be right back. Don't get dressed. <laughs> oh, fantastic. Oh, holy. Wondershare Filmorite is a user-friendly, easy-to-use video editing software which contains hundreds of special effects for video that allows you to easily create a unique visual effect. Head to www.wondershare.net and get started editing now. This is PJ Souls, and you are totally watching Death Curse Society. So keep watching. All righty, gang. Thanks for sticking around. We're back. It's time for some stories around the campfire. I don't want to scare anyone, but I'm going to give it to you straight about Jason. <laughs> First up on Stories Around the Campfire, we got to talk a little bit about The Walking Dead, which recently debuted its 10th season on AMC. Ziggy, what do you think about the first couple episodes? This one, this year, starting off a little stronger, I guess. Now we're starting to get background stories of secondary and third thirdary characters. And we've kind of set our piece on The Walking Dead a couple seasons ago, even. You know, it's like, ah, you know, we're, it's losing us. But having said that, the last, the first couple of these seasons, okay. More so last week's episode, where the whisperers, you know, uh, we got the backstory of Alpha and Beta. But I'm asking myself the whole time, do I fucking care anymore? It's interesting, but I, man, I want to see the factions go to war. Let's get on with this already. Let's see some blood and some action. I'll say it. I don't give a fuck about the backstory about any of these characters anymore, you know? I mean, we got what we got the first seven or eight years of The Walking Dead, and we got all the character backstories that, you know, the ones that we lived and died with for all those years. I'm a little uh, apprehensive to invest anything, especially into what our supposed to be the enemy of the people I'm rooting for. I watched, but I, my heart's not in it like it used to be. Well, The Walking Dead has always kind of given you some backstory. They've, dra they've dragged it out the way they do, but they've always given you some backstory to the antagonist. Even the governor, you found out that his daughter was, you know, zombified in the, in the past, and he was keeping her and trying to protect her. You got you know, Negan and a little bit of knowledge about his wife and why he named the bat Lucille and all that, but we haven't even gotten into all the layers of that really yet. So it doesn't necessarily bother me that they're giving us backstory on Alpha and Beta. I think what's a little bit different from the governor and from Negan is that Alpha's just batshit crazy. And that just takes this, takes this enemy 
up a, a certain level. You know, the fact that she's able to talk to this guy that's basically secluded himself, Beta, into this hospital, barricaded himself in and is trying to survive on his own, and she goes in and just fucking changes his whole slate of life knowledge in a day is fucking weird. The fact that she's able to do that is a pretty strong character trait about her as well. At least it shows me how she's able to form this kind of cult-like status and this cult-like group around her and lead these people and make them face their own death. It's strange, and, and I think it actually works pretty well for this. There were moments two episodes ago when uh, like Beta was actually questioning Alpha's motives and is your vision still there? You know what I mean? So there's a little bit of dissension there, but I mean, batshit crazy. Oh boy, I don't even know if that is qualifies it enough, man, because she comes off fucking nuts. Mm -hmm. This could play into some interesting scenarios with her strategies, I think. That's what's interesting about it. I'm just missing not seeing our guys like all the time, you know, (laughs) so far in this season. That happens to a lot of shows as they go on for 10 years, you know? You lose cast members. I don't think this show's budget has necessarily gone up exponentially every year to be able to keep the actors that they've had for so many years. That's that's a big reason why a lot of these actors are jumping ship is because they finish a contract and it's like, you got to pay me more now. Oh, AMC hadn't given us a budget for that, so you're dead. Yeah, well, Maggie, you know, she went off and did her little series, didn't make it. She's crawling back, so. But I don't know if she's going to necessarily be a huge part of the show. She might be just a featured person. So here we are, season 10 of The Walking Dead. It's a lot like a loveless marriage where you stick together just for the kids. (laughs) I've invested too much time to walk away from this show. I'll admit, season 10 has started off better than it has in recent memory. That's not saying much. It's just people walking around fucking talking. I might as well watch Lord of the Rings, honestly, at this point. At least I see more of the undead in the Lord of the Rings than I have so far in The Walking Dead. Uh, as far as you guys' discussion about Alpha goes, is she batshit crazy? Does she? She's surviving the best way she can. There's some good and evil is fucking perspective. In her mind, her followers mind, they're good. The other people are fucking evil. You can't live like that. That's a fantasy dream. You can't do that. I see your point there, but the fact that she kills Beta's best friend that's, you know, with in the hospital with him that he's been trying to take care of and protect or whatever, and then convinces him to cut his goddamn face off and wear it, that's not just a survival mechanism, I don't think. That, that's a little bit of psychosis. Hey, Jedi mind tricks work on the simple-minded. Let's be honest here. Beta's not all fucking there either. At least stick up for Alpha a little bit. If that was my kid, I would have killed the fucking thing, too. She's protecting her daughter. She didn't give a fuck who that was. She Mm -hmm. did what she had to do. Yeah, you're right. She's totally sane. Is Daryl not insane? I remember him fucking making little trinkets in season two. Yeah. Nobody's all there if you made it this fucking long, let's be honest. How could you be? How could you be? I think, and, and it sounds like he does, too, that Alpha is just a little bit step above where even a regular person would be crazy by this point. Anybody want to talk about speculation for who Beta is or who Beta was? Because I don't know about you guys, but it almost seemed like when Alpha took off his mask after she killed his best friend, when she takes the mask off, there's a slight recognition there. Like, I never expected to see you out here, but like she knows this person, but not friendly with them. Did you guys catch that at all or... I caught it, but I didn't think about it, to be honest with you. I just assumed he's part of the fucking insane asylum there at the hospital because he's covering his face, that or deformed, defig- fucking, I don't know. I, I was kind of like thinking almost like a, almost like a pity or a, a, a acceptance kind of feeling, you know what I mean? It, it, um, not so much like, oh, I, yeah, you, you know? It was more like, oh, it's, it's okay, I'm here for you, you know what I mean? That's what I got when I saw that. So. Well, I'm, I'm wondering if he's not somebody famous. Hmm. Like an actor or a you know, singer or something like that, that like if Justin Bieber somehow survived the zombie apocalypse and you came across him, you'd be like, I'm surprised you made it this far. That kind of familiarity. And you can catch up weekly on the Slasher Report right here from Death Curse Society as we're breaking them down for you. We got The Walking Dead. We've got Creep Show. We've got American Horror Story. We do these a couple days after the episode to keep you current. That way you're not having two-week gaps. And then having to bludgeon yourself with all that information of two weeks, we give it to you in nice bite-sized pieces every single week. So dig it. The Slash Report, only from Death Curse Society. Sounds like Zag's ready to move on. <laughs>
Next up on Stories Around the Campfire, let's talk about the new release on DVD and video on demand from Fangoria and RLJE Films, Satanic Panic. Colonel, or no, let's watch the trailer first. Should we watch the trailer? Yeah, let's watch the yeah, trailer. Yeah, I think we should watch the trailer. Here. for the tips. In four hours, my total earnings are an expired Applebee's coupon. A sweater that smells like racism. It's exactly oh, your size. Oh. oh. Deliver for meal basin. It's outside our zone. I'll do it. Are you ready to make an investment in your future? Yes. Are you ready to take back what you are owed? Yes. Are you ready to fully commit yourselves to Satan? Yes! Who are you? I'm the pizza guy. A girl? Are you by any chance a virgin? That's a very personal question. She's a virgin. Oh. Whose power unlocks our true potential? Hail Satan! Do you have any idea what's happening here tonight? Hail Satan! They are summoning Baphomet, a big demon from hell. And when that clock strikes 12, he is going to rip you open. Where's my virgin? I don't know what's happening. My mom and her butt buddies are booty calling Baphomet. Hell, Satan! And they're not going to stop until you're strapped to a barbed wire altar. That's bonkers. Any idea why the rich stay rich? And you stay screwed? Mm, better health care. Hell, Satan! They are stronger than us. No virgin, no sacrifice. Let me protect you. Oh, how are you people? Death to the weak, wealth to the strong. Hail Satan! You should stop drinking. You really want to face this over? Get that mean lady! I'm sorry! All right, so that's the trailer for Satanic Panic that just dropped on video on demand and on DVD October 22nd. Colonel, what do you think of this trailer? This story sounds kind of familiar from a movie we've already seen earlier this year, titled Ready or Not, which I loved. They don't mirror each other, but it's not a mirror, but it's close enough. Based on the trailer, Rebecca Romaine is playing the rich bitch. She's rich, and she looks like a bitch. Jerry O'Connell looks like he's going to be our com comedic relief somewhat in this film, based on the one little scene we got. So it looks entertaining, but I have a feeling I'll be like, Ready or Not was a better movie, because they're to me, kind of the same thing, like I already said. So I also made the connection to Ready or Not, as far as the humor level, that type of humor. It also reminded me of another, another one from 1985, Lorraine Hutton and Jim Carrey in Once Bitten. Mm -hmm. The whole virgin angle with the blood and everything like that. I, obviously, quite a bit different, but it just it reminded me of that. Like, oh, okay, she has a value being a virgin here. But it does look like uh, hijinks and hilarity are going to ensue around some violent deaths and maybe an appearance of Baphomet at the end there. I don't know. Kind of on the fence with this one, you know? It looks like it could be smart and entertaining, and it looks like it could be a cliche-riddled piece of shit, you know? I mean, <laughs> I don't know. Maybe I have a little bit of a soft spot for a pizza delivery girl, you know what I mean? Okay, since everyone's making comparisons to other films, I'll throw this one out there. What about Secret Santa? Just the style of humor and even the... The way the trailer is kind of put together reminded me of the Secret Santa trailer from Skeleton Crew. And our buddy Adam Marcus, which we're going to be talking about briefly later. I know I say this a lot, but it seems interesting. I will watch it, but that's, uh, it's middle of the road interesting. It's not peaked, and I'm just, I'm not at that I don't give a shit level. It's right in the middle of the road. I think it'll be fun. I think, I think it will be cliche, though, which I'm not necessarily against if it's done well. I don't mind a few cliches in movies if it's written well and it, and it fits the overall theme of the movies. Satanic Panic, it's available now on DVD and video on demand. Colonel? Ziggy? Guys? What happened? Where'd you go? All right. Look, gang, we had a few technical difficulties on the second half of our video that we recorded for the show. It wasn't usable. Sorry. 
I'm going to wrap up what we talked about in the last few segments of Stories Around the Campfire for you. We discussed Maniac Cop coming to HBO. Zigzag and Colonel were excited about these 80s horror films being revamped for a new audience. Colonel doesn't think it should go further than one season, though. We'll see what happens when HBO debuts Maniac Cop sometime in 2020. We also talked about the Nickelodeon revamp of Are You Afraid of the Dark, which debuted recently. Now, honestly, I only got to see one episode of this. I don't have Nickelodeon on my cable lineup anymore. I will say this. For someone that had never seen the original series, I was pretty intrigued by it. I want to see the other two episodes now. It's only a three-episode storyline. Colonel was excited about this. He was a fan of the original series in the 90s on Nickelodeon. This was a lot of nostalgia for him. Colonel did mention that this is not like the series. It's kind of more like the movie that we've been promised for the last few years, and they just split it up into three different episodes. For the storyline, I really enjoyed it. It's about this girl that moves to a new town, doesn't make a whole lot of new friends, except for one kid that has a watch horror movies sweatshirt on, and that kind of gets her attention. Through a series of mysterious notes, she's invited to visit the Midnight Society. She's told, again mysteriously, to go write a story and come back 24 hours later and tell her story. If the story is good enough, she'll become a member of the Midnight Society. So that's what she does. She goes home, she goes to school the next day, she starts writing this story, she comes back the next night, tells the story, the other members of the Midnight Society take the mask off that they're wearing, revealing their true identities, and welcome her into the group. The next day, her story begins to come to life. Pretty simple storyline, but it really worked well for this show. Like I said, I'm looking forward to the other two episodes if I can find them somewhere. Are You Afraid of the Dark is available on Nickelodeon right now. Check it out. We also talked about Friday the 13th, Game Over, a new fan film that is currently funding on Indiegogo. Check this trailer out and I'll be right back. Game Over, which is funding on Indiegogo right now. Here's my take on it. This is one of the few times that a fan film has truly looked outside the box. It's not really a fan film of the movies. It's a fan film of the video game, or at least the look of the video game. So the original video game, the 1989 NES version. Whew, the ones you had to blow on to get to work, if you know what I mean. I like the fact that it's taken it a little bit outside the box. I like that it's not trying to pick a piece of the storyline and tell a new story from there. You know, breaking up the storyline. They have no rules. They have a certain look to the Jason. They have a very limited set, you know, because basically they had cabins, forests, and like a little almost like a sidewalk or path that is in the game. These filmmakers can do whatever the hell they want. They can go anywhere with this film. That's one thing I'm looking forward to. So check it out on Indiegogo, Friday the 13th, game over. Throw them a few bucks if you're into it. Another fan film coming out sometime in 2020, hopefully, is Dylan's New Nightmare, which is a takeoff from Wes Craven's New Nightmare and brings back Miko Hughes as the titular character, Dylan. Check this trailer out. It's been 25 years. 
25 years locked in a mental prison with no means of escape. Nothing to do but wait and watch. Trapped in the mind of a little piggy that escaped the slaughter. Too weak to defeat the Guardian. Until now. Now it's time to have some fun. Twenty-five years after the release of Wes Craven's New Nightmare comes a fan-made sequel, Dylan's New Nightmare. And some of you may have recognized the voice of Freddy in that trailer. Yes, that is Dave McRae from YouTube. He is finally going to get on his acting chops for a film that's not one of his fan films. I'm kind of curious to see what he can do with Freddy in this. He's got the voice I think he's even, he's kind of a student of movement and gestures, so I think he's going to have that down too, but does he have the real acting chops to pull this off in a film? Great voice actor, not knocking him there. Can he do it for real, even in a fan film? Best of luck to Dave McRae and everybody involved with Dylan's New Nightmare. I'm looking forward to this, so check him out on Indiegogo and see what you can do. Since we're talking about Indiegogo, I have to mention Hearts of Darkness, the making of the final Friday. It's brought to you by our friends Adam Marcus, Ali Rivera, and the Skeleton Crew. It's about the making of Jason Goes to Hell, the final Friday. Yes, debated as possibly one of the worst films in the Friday the 13th franchise, but we are big fans of this. We are big fans of Adam Marcus here at Death Curse Society, and we're about to drop a little bit of knowledge on you. The Death Curse Society is going to be associate producers on this film. So we've already made our donation. We've already gotten involved with it. And we cannot wait to be a part of this. So if you would like to help out Hearts of Darkness, the making of the final Friday, check out the link in the description below for a link to their Indiegogo campaign. Best of luck, Adam Marcus, Allie, and everybody else involved with Skeleton Crew on this. Can't wait to see it. And that basically would have wrapped up stories around the campfire. So to wrap up the show, since the co-hosts aren't here, like I said, we had some technical difficulties. I want to do a special thanks and shout out to Filmora for the video editing software that we use every week to put these shows together and bring to you. It's just a beautiful and easy piece of software to use. If you're into video editing and you have no idea where you're starting with, check out Filmora. Don't forget to check out our website at deathcursesociety.com and also make sure you follow and keep in touch with us on all of our social media. That's where we're really interactive and we talk to you, the fans out there. We're on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and of course YouTube. If you're on YouTube, make sure you subscribe and hit that notification bell so you don't miss a video from us. And if you're in the t-shirts, we got t-shirts as well. We've got this one that I'm wearing right now. It's our brand new design featuring Dr. Loomis. Death has come to your little town, and the Death Curse Society logo. You can pick one of these up, or you can get our original DCS logo t-shirt. All you got to do is send $20 to paypal.me slash zigzagisdcs. Mention your address, mention what size of shirt you want, and we'll ship it right out to you. That's 20 bucks for sizes small through extra large, 2X and up. It's 25 bucks for the more to love taxes, the, you know, the guys normally like to say. Our next episode will be November 7th. 
We're going to be talking about Dr. Sleep, which I'm really excited about. Cannot wait to see what happened to Danny Torrance after the events of The Shining. So, for my missing co-host, the Colonel and Zigzag, this is Red Crank saying DCS out. Thanks for tuning in, and we'll see you next time. Ooh. Happy Halloween, fuckers. Glass.